patch 5 came a brand new way to play Baldur's Gate, Honor Mode, full of boss changes and challenges. I'll be stopping by every boss on the way, discovering their new abilities and how to best deal with them. Somehow this run is going to be even harder than last time, where we were jack of all trades. That being said, let's go over the rules. <clears throat> huh? Oh, there are no rules. I normally limit myself in runs, taking away certain abilities, though Honor Mode is supposedly a true testament to game knowledge, so let's use everything I've learned up until now to beat Honor Mode, a lone wolf. Now let's go over the build. Gloomstalker Assassin. This is an absurdly powerful build and I've been looking for an excuse to justify playing it. Surely Honor Mode counts. Regardless, we'll be taking Ranger levels up until level 7. Upon reaching level 8, we'll respec into 5 Ranger, 3 Rogue, and round it off with Fighter. For what I have planned, our race of choice will be the Dwergar. On top of their Dark Vision and Resistances, their innate invisibility is broken to say the least. We'll also be the Dark Urge, which allows us certain story decisions and gives character specific loot. We'll be a Beast Tamer in order to summon a variety of useful summons with Find Familiar. Favorite enemy doesn't really matter too much, though I do like taking Bounty Hunter since it gives us a good passive. And here's our stats we'll be rocking with. Maxing Dexterity, of course. Now, let's move. Being the Dark Urge is perfect lore-wise, since in this run, the ends justify the means. Meaning being a jerk lore-wise for XP is perfectly in character. And as always, our first target and encounter is Lazel, who wants to kill demons and get off this thing. We physically can't say no, so she tanks all the hits while I deal all the damage. Afterwards, it's time to remove her and her armor from the party. Lazel's armor is the best for this period in the game, giving 15 AC, plus dex, and so is her underwear. It fits me much more, I feel. Now all that's left to do is shove her in the pit. I'm too lazy to do the math, but these are all 58% chances, so do let me know how unlucky I am. Oh, for fuck. With Lazel dead, we meet another important ally, locked in a magical prison, Crab. Crab here will be our only ally for the discernible future, so let's put him to work. We have several forms of familiars we can cast, but Crab is unquestionably the best, as you can plainly see. We don't care about Zog for this build, so we rush out of here to get to the real meat of the run. The Helm's alien transponder. A quick crash land later, and we appear on the Sword Coast with a bad case of Ceramorphosis. Our goal is to cure it without dying a single time. Given our troubling backstory, it may complicate things. So far, our only saving grace is an artifact called the Astral Prison. It'll be following us against our will, but do note it for later. We pass by Lazel, who's doing some daily get Yankee yoga, and set my crab to deal with the locals. While he does that, I'll stealthily be moving along. Something I often ignore is this portal, since it has a very large burden inside. However, lucky for us, we can cut him out of the picture altogether. This stone has saved me so much time. Maybe I should try luring a boss here one day. With that, it's level 2, and with it comes some spells and a fighting style. I'm a short dwarf, so I have less movement than normal, so Longstrider will help with that. Fog Cloud is an all around good spell, so we'll grab that too, and Archery for our fighting style. Our crab is bravely fighting off these enemies. A conveniently placed Nautiloid tank will be the perfect relief. Oh, well, that was disappointing. Regrettably, our crab falls, but his sacrifice will not be forgotten. Brains are kind of scary early on, but we leveled to level 2 just in case. So we spawn another crab and move on to the first large combat. As usual, a good strategy to succeed here is to isolate the high ground and go from there. We do have the almighty crab at our disposal, so we surely can't lose. Early on, it's mostly just hitting each other until one side runs out of HP. So let's get to level 3 as fast as we can. We outnumber them, have more healing, and are rallied, so not too much to say other than I'm glad Barth died. Barth has a hand crossbow on him, which are one-handed crossbows, meaning we can dual wield them. We'll be dual wielding hand crossbows for a good portion of the act since we don't have a real use for our bonus action currently. There are several in-character things to do before progressing. Exhibit A. And Exhibit B. Now that those crucial steps are dealt with, we stop by the local blacksmith who fortunately has our second hand crossbow in the store. 
These things fire two shots at once, and they'll be even better if we can put poison on it and the like. I try out some more familiars, this time a giant spider, and I regret it immediately. Brab would have hit bows. In the end though, the giant eagle statue helps the most. Being short has its downsides. First downside of tiny legs are tiny jumps. There's some boxes around so we make a makeshift booster seat and get across fine. Everyone else minds up. We finish looting over here and move just outside to some absolute cultists. Some weird cult that keeps getting name dropped. You're a true soul. And something about true souls. We'll want to resonate with the parasite here for later. We'll need all the help we can get and parasites are a huge boon in that regard. There's only like three in this entire first area, so it's important we get them all. One thing our parasite lets us do is dominate creatures. Nah, well, inspiration. I don't want any trouble just before level 3. And with level 3 comes our subclass, Gloomstalker. This gives bonus action stealth, a way to turn invisible, extra damage turn 1, and dark vision. For being a Dwergar, we can also enlarge once every long rest. Spells really don't matter, I won't even be casting them except for Longstrider for the most part, but we'll take jump just to have it. One thing we want to get at the center of town, the Haste Helm, which boosts our speed even more. So far, all of our items and abilities are just compensating for our height. The next one, not so much. At the neighboring Joaquin's rest, the whole place is ablaze. We help the guard to break in, and we work to save the food and any survivors. At least ones that will reward me. The Jolt Shooter is our prize. It's probably better than my hand crossbows, but you won't see me using it. I'm not done compensating for my height, so at the Goblin Camp, we pick up some boots that will give us some important ups. We can give our thanks to the Swirezy Shoes. 1.5 meters is nothing to scoff at, and considering we have no boots and these are only 100 gold, it's a worthwhile purchase. It's is out of character, but we'll need to save Volo, since more importantly than anything, he has a very important buff for us. There's another buff we can get at the neighboring follower to Leviathar. I make it easier by stripping into my gimp clothes to be an ardent apostle, but I roll two natural ones, so unfortunately we'll have to do without the buff this go around. But who needs buffs when you have barrels? We'll be saving these for later. They do big damage in a big area, so they'll be useful all game. I usually ban Barrelmancy, but no rules, sucka. I'm still too short to leave, though. Go Go Gadget Booster Seat. What I'm doing next is very stupid, so I'm sure to buy an invisibility potion just in case. We'll park one barrel right here for no reason at all, and light it up from a distance. Discreet. So, uh, as predicted, everyone in the camp now hates me, and I think it's a good time to drink that invisibility potion we just got. After coming back, we can loot our prize, Crusher's Ring. If you thought I was compensating before, well, how about now? Three extra meters of movement speed. It's such a decent ring to have, especially earlier where there's a lack of good ones. Now we have something like 15 meters of movement speed as a small creature, so pretty good I'd say. I don't know about you, but I love this cutscene. I find it so funny that renowned author Volothamp just says fuck it and shoves an ice pick in your eye socket. I agree. It's a feisty critter. Just a little further. Volo tears the pick from your brain with a violent jerk. Your eye plops down into the mud. Threat. It of course goes poorly, but he at least gives us an eye letting us see invisibility. I'll come in handy later this act. After surgery, all I want to do is lay down and some stupid bard shows up. I begrudgingly tell her she can stay, go to sleep, and she's dead. You open your eyes with a lurch, and you are not in your bed. You stand well, good thing no one is around to see that. Let's go talk to Best Girl and help her out with her job. Minthara is a devout follower of the Absolute and is tasked to find and kill the Goblin Camp. We'll help her out with her ambush, and get a head start on some druids nobody cares about. Nettie, or this bird. Nettie also has a parasite in the back, and at this point we can unleash our illithid potential. 
there's a whole tree of useful abilities. I'll mostly be going for the passives, since we only have so many actions. The important ones I'll be getting are Ability Drain, Luck of the Far Realms, and Call the Weak, in no particular order. I do like guaranteed crits though, so I'll grab it first. Progressing on our journey, we're visited by the Devil Raphael. I don't deal with devils, I'm sure he has interesting things to say, but I do know if you mash 4 you get free food. One last visit to the ruins outside the grove. I hear there's an old and ancient power deep in these walls. Handles. With a candle, we can dip our weapon in fire before our combat to add an extra G4 damage to our shots. We can also do the same with poisons, but this is the easiest and is renewable. We use this to kill our neighboring gnolls since their ears will be useful in a not far future, crafting potions of speed. Again. Now being this mobile, we can disengage if they get too close and shoot them with our bonus action, so we're never in true danger. Oftentimes, you'll see me escaping and reinitiating a combat, since this helps us play as safe as possible. We can often disengage for free because of our invisibility, so most large groups of enemies are trickled down. Gnolls are also protecting this chest, which we'll need for later. And as useful as the contents may be, we'll be returning it to the owner. I'm sure these guys won't mind too much. Later in camp tonight, we can't sleep since it feels like we're being watched, and it ends up being some guy calling himself our butler. Turns out he was around when Alfira that bard from earlier was turned to but a fine mist, but he's got a reward and it's the best cape in the game. The Death Stalker Mantle, which gives us invisibility after every single kill. Perfect for our build since we'll be able to whittle down large groups of enemies from relative safety. A bad example of this is right at the goblin camp. They've heard of the incoming attack from the goblins and are standing to fight. I've infiltrated their defenses and have a surefire way of ending the fight before Minthara even gets here. The tieflings have happened to leave several barrels of volatile oil around, which I round up and use my cat familiar to attract them all. Curiosity gets the better of them, and they're all burnt to ash, even with their fire resistance. We couldn't quite get everyone with that explosion, so one guy has to now face off against the entire assault force, which probably could have dealt with the tieflings on their own. I spare him from that reality. One thing you can do with your poisons is throw it on the ground in camp and dip your weapons into it. This poison will remain in your camp forever, so similarly we can dip prior to combats. Do know that if our camp ever changes, the poison won't come with us. Use the poison to great effect, killing Wrath in one round before you can even do anything meaningful. We killed Netty earlier, so Kaga is the only real threat. Her Moonbeam does tons of damage to a group, and she can change the location of it every round if we let her. But our two shots are enough to break her concentration. We can keep diverting Kaga's attention away from the goblins, keeping them alive as much as possible to help tank and inevitably kill Kaga. As a reward for our transgressions, Minthara visits us at night for some hanky panky. I unfortunately was never good with woman. You draw her closer with all the vim of a lover's first embrace. We get a tadpole at least. I'm deciding to grab Cole the Week next. With a new day comes some more shopping. This was patched out shortly after honor mode, but I was able to do it a couple times, so I thought I'd showcase it. We can use a container, a ribcage for instance, and sell it to a vendor. By placing the vendor's inventory inside it, we can buy it for one gold piece and remove the contents from inside, buying out a vendor's inventory for only one gold. I did this twice on Auntie to get a good number of hell giant strengths for later. Making our way to the next section, the Enderdark, we get even more movement equipment, giving Misty Step for free. Solving a puzzle has me feeling so accomplished I level up to 4, giving us our first feat. We have an archery build, so we'll be taking Sharpshooter, which removes low ground debuffs and gives us a toggleable ability, allowing us to do 10 additional damage at the cost of 5 accuracy. Being a Dwergar, we'll want to go to our home, the Underdark, and get some valuable equipment from my brethren before any bosses. Thanks for watching this far. If you want to catch the next part of the series, you know what to do. We carefully navigate past some mushrooms right into an ambush. We don't have invisibility potions, but it's dark enough down here to use our umbral shroud to disengage from combat. More careful navigation later, we make it to an outpost owned by my brethren. Have I mentioned how much I love movement items? Well, Gek here wants us to go fetch a pair of boots for him, and these boots I'll be wearing for the rest of the game. It really is a pain to get them violently. 
She's been hit by a poison, and Gek has the antidote. Pickpocketing it will wrap up the situation nicely. Ah, jeez. So anyways, we go bring the antidote to the Deep Gnome, who, in exchange for saving her life, gives us the Boots of Speed, letting us click our heels as a bonus action. Eventually, we'll be a rogue, so this will be less good, but they also help in disengaging, so they'll still be very good later on. I spend nearly 2,000 gold on a ring from Dareth, the Caustic Band. What do we get for all this gold? Two acid damage. It doesn't sound all too appealing, but a flat guaranteed plus two to all of our attacks is fantastic, especially elemental damage. Now back to Gek. He doesn't want to talk to me understandably, and I don't want to give him any gold either, so I'll just steal his boat. We'll need to take it in order to reach the Dwagger outpost. This outpost contains some very important items which will carry us through the early acts. One Dwagger we need is Corsair Greyman. He's got a weapon for us, so it's important that we keep him alive. Despite being Dwagger, we can be racist towards our fellow Dwagger, curiously. There's an important ring off to the side, and it's fairly easy to grab with a fog cloud. This ring gives us invisibility, which we won't need for long, but it's good to have on hand. Raymond has arrived at his shop, and he sells a bow called the Bow of the Banshee. This bow inflicts Frighten, which is a broken mechanic, since enemies can't even take an action if afflicted, and a little bonus damage never hurt anyone. We have the chance to demonstrate it on our brethren. Notice how the frightened one can't do a thing. And because it lasts two turns, we have a bonus to hit him next turn to re-inflict the debuff. It's about time we retired our hand crossbows since we have several uses for our bonus actions now. These Dwager were protecting a passageway leading to a long forgotten temple, at the end of which lies a curious lava pit. This is the Adamantine Forge, where Mithril is used to make some of the best armor in the game. We'll be making two pieces this run, the shield and the plate, since we're using Lazel's armor still at this point. Killing the guards nets us our final bit of XP to level 5, and we reach our power spike. With level 5 comes an extra attack to double our damage output, and cantrip invisibility, meaning we can cast it as many times as we want, though only once in combat. With this newfound power, we can make the final preparations for fighting bosses, and this little shack outside Joaquin's Rest has our best bow. I should have came here way earlier, but I was worried if I didn't have a source of invisibility, so I wanted to wait till level 5. We talk our way into the camp and learn that this is where the cargo from before was headed. Turns out the Zenturum, an underground merchant network, was tasked with its transport. Whatever's inside this thing must be good since they give us a bunch of gold and access to our best bow, the Titan String Bow. This allows us to add our strength modifier to our damage, so if we drink a Hill Giant Strength Elixir, we'll be doing an extra 5 damage a hit. This is on top of our dexterity, so we also get an additional plus 3 damage to our hits. And I'll be planning to get my dexterity to 20 by the end for plus 5. Just one more thing to grab before we fight any bosses, we kill Gek for the Mykonid leader to let us into this treasure vault. There's a headpiece in here called the Shadow of Memories of Barbarazan, uh, which lets us go invisible. Just in case. I think we're well enough prepared to fight Auntie. We failed to notice the path behind the fire, so we'll need to smack Auntie once so she can open it herself. But Auntie doesn't have one, but two magical doors blocking our path. We're perceptive enough to know that this is a real fake door and can just walk through. And the next area is a group of four masked creatures. For the ensuing boss battle, we'll want to kill three of them, as you'll see in a second. I just make sure the healer is dead at the least, since they'll heal Auntie. Poison Resistance lets us run through the traps for one whole damage, leaving us fresh for Auntie. She's invisible, so I'll join her. She can't see invisible creatures like myself though, and it only takes a second to catch her out. She has the legendary action Weird Magic Surge, which lets her create more clones every time you cast a spell. I don't have many spells fortunately, so it won't come into play too much. Auntie is susceptible to Drow Poison, so I coat my weapon and miss an 88% chance. Fortunately, this is why we made preparations. Auntie's first action is to always summon her masked allies to help her. We killed them all though, so she just teleports a bunch of corpses to fight me. We do want to leave at least one alive, otherwise she'll summon her clones instead, which is very deadly. We miss even more shots and failed to sleep Auntie, so we're already in a tricky spot. Auntie has gotten around to summoning her clones, which can all hold person us, so we'll need to wrap this up. I drink a potion of speed to give us an extra action to help me escape, casting our invisibility, and having Auntie teleport out of the way. 
Normally she'd be dead by now, but I got some unlucky rolls, so we'll need to fall back on plan C. We retreat to auntie's quarters, barring the door and hiding ourselves in the corner. We can't see anything in the other room, but everyone seems to be real confused on how to actually reach me. They have to say they can't, and after unbarricading the door, we can continue laying into auntie. I don't actually want to kill her, so we turn off our sharpshooter passive to do just enough. Of course it's only now at this point that I sleep her, but whatever. Of course I get all the crits when they don't matter as well. Hiding for one more round, Auntie wants to give up and we happily oblige her. Uh, wait just a tick. She'll give us a single ability score improvement and we'll want to put it into dexterity. This will round us off with a nice 18 dexterity or plus 4. One boss down, let's work on the rest. Heading back to the abandoned village, down the well is a spider den, filled with, um, spiders. And of course, Big Mama Spider. As long as we're heading off to the side, she'll let us buff up, so we dip our weapon just beforehand and enlarge. Mama Spider has alert, so it's best if we just enlarge beforehand. Just by ourselves, we can do a good 100 damage on the first turn. Our attacks have something like plus 11 damage on hit. With our sharpshooter passive active, that increases to something like plus 21, though all it takes is 3 hits to get her down to half HP. And by hasting and shooting the web beneath her, just barely not do enough damage. If I was real smart, I would have shot the web first to get the high ground bonus, but I'm just not. Mama Spider's first turn, she doesn't even spend attacking us, but instead spawning her spiderlings. Now, it's crucial that you don't attack any spiderlings, since her legendary action, Gosmer Tomb, will immobilize you and kill you. She's only got 20 HP left though, so we can finish the job and move on to the next. Not before killing her babies. We're here at the mountain pass, and we have something to buy before progressing. Off at Lady Esther is the Periaptic Wound Closure, which lets us heal for maximum. This is absolutely broken with friends and is very good solo since we can throw potions on ourselves and drink them. Healing 60 HP with greater healing potions, this is a very important item for our survivability. In the mountain pass is the Get the Yankee Crush, home to the next boss, Ward Wargaz. We stealth past everyone and make it safely to his chambers. Now he has a very deadly legendary action for Lone Wolf, and we can probably beat him one on one, but I'm not gonna risk it. In case you're wondering, his legendary action has him summon swords in retaliation every turn. These swords can threaten us giving us disadvantage on our hits and can overwhelm us, so it's best if we avoid it altogether. Instead, we're gonna kill him with... a cat. Curiosity killed the Githyanki, and we're able to pull Ward Wargaz away from his guard and over to this nearby cliff. And shove him in with a 99% chance. Okay, plan B. Just throw him in. Thank goodness. We work backwards and proceed to kill his guard that were left in the room. Our damage output, as you can see, is really good for the stage in the game, and is only going to get stronger once we reach level 8 and multi-class into an assassin. An added bonus of being a Gloomstalker is every time we reinitiate a combat, we can get an extra empowered attack, really helping with our hit and run playstyle. And is only going to get stronger when we reach level 8 and multi-class into an assassin. After killing everyone, the Get the Yankee Queen Vlacketh appears and wants us to travel into the Astral Plasm to defeat blah blah blah. Spoilers, you don't get any XP for doing it. You do get XP for killing all the Get the Yankee. And I do mean all the Get the Yankee. Okay, that's all of them. We get a bunch of XP from my troubles and two parasites which we use to get Call the Weak, allowing us to execute low HP enemies. Ability Drain was a close second pick. Since our boat uses Dexterity, we can basically use it to lower enemies armor class over time, but we'll get it soon enough. We visit our old friends in the center outpost to top off our XP and get level 6 before the last bosses.
Damn, I should have probably grabbed those first. Whatever, we get enough. Level 6 doesn't give us much, but we'll grab the fire resistance considering where we're headed now. The Adamantine Forge. One more unused familiar shape to use is the bird. So let's try it out. We use our bird familiar to hit the lever and valve to unleash the defender of the forge, Grim. Usually there's a cutscene here showing our character paralyzed in fear, but we just so happen to be up top still, so Grim kinda just gets mad at the air. I've killed Grim many ways, but haven't done it this way yet, and it's by far the easiest. You'll want to just sit on top of the platform and pepper Grim with arrows from afar. He's resistant to piercing, so it'll take a while, but it'll get it done. You'll also cool down after time, so be sure to shimmy yourself so that Grim walks back into the lava. He has a legendary action that does AoE damage, but I wouldn't worry about it. Just shoot him till he dies. It's the general strategy that tends to work. I'll spare you the compilation, but do know it was 57 arrows. We drink a Featherfall potion and jump down to claim our prize, the Adamantine Plate and Shield, both of which we'll be wearing for a fair portion of the game. Here's our current loadout and stats, but we're not quite done yet. Our last weapon before fighting the last boss is back at the Githyanki Crush in the Mountain Pass. It is a puzzle that requires four unique weapons to be placed on their pedestals, giving us the Dawn Master Crest. Returning to the room with Ward Wargaz, a secret passage exists on the left, and after using the Dawn Master Crest on this platform, the Blood of Lothander is ours. This will be fantastic for Act 2, and you'll see why in a second. Now back to Grimforge, we free Nier from a cave with the Smoke Powder Barrel and move to Intercept. He has a legendary action giving him immunity from all physical damage and doing retaliatory damage instead. There's a very simple method to bypass this. Shoot him dead before he gets a shot. He'll use it after the second hit, assuming you surprised him, but keep in mind it only gives him protection against bludgeoning, slashing, and piercing. Nobody said anything about Radiant. Yep, the Blood of Lathander lets us shoot laser beams, letting us one round near before he even gets a turn. We finish up all the Dwerger around the room, and, in doing so, free the Deep Gnomes that were held in captivity. They all return to the Mykonid camp, where Thula, the one who gave us our boots of speed, is delighted. Despite all of the murdering we did, we managed to pull off a good deed. Let's just hope Karma doesn't come back to bite me in Act 2. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Well, this run's dead. Say goodbye to it. That's all you're getting. What? I'm wearing metal? Oh, I'm wearing Lee Cell's metal. Ugh. Well, here's the slow trickle, I guess. I, I can always just disengage, but it's annoying. Ugh. 